Well, let, uh, we'll get started here. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much to everyone for coming out to hear Lindin read his work. My name is Logan Esdale, and I teach in the English department. And uh, I have some special thank yous. First of all, to my partner, Anna. Not my partner. Oh, my. My partner in crime. My poetry partner in crime. <laughs> Anna Leahy, Professor Anna Leahy in the English Department for um, organizing this with, with uh, me. And we both want to thank the Department of English for its support. Uh, for Tabula Poetica, Poetry at Chapman University. Also to Leatherby Libraries, very much, for uh, allowing us to use their space for this reading, for hosting us. And to Poets and Writers, which has a grant from the James Irvine Foundation for also lending its support. So thank you very, very much. I hope many of you at this point have a little souvenir uh, to take with you, which on the back lists Lindin's books. Uh, and there are a couple of poems in there as well. Um, I'm going to say a few things about him and then turn things over to him. I heard a story on the radio last week that made me think of Lindin's work. I listened to a man say that because his experience as an American soldier during World War II was so awful, the army was segregated into white and black, and he did not want to become a killer. That experience had been so awful that he was briefly institutionalized for mental instability. He discovered there, to his amazement and sorrow, that being there was quite wonderful, relatively speaking. In that hospital, there was no segregation. The patients were, in the mental ward, treated equally. How bitter to find that civil rights in 1943 operated only in a place for those who had been deemed unfit. The man's name was Roy, uh, Ray de Carava, and he died a week ago. The interview I heard was from 1996. After the war, de Carava became one of America's great photographers of everyday life, especially in Harlem. In Linden's work, we encounter characters, I think, like de Carava, as he was in 1943, voices that articulate the experience of dislocation, the conditions for sanity and humanity might be found in the most unlikely places, in prison, for instance. Din's characters are often not where they intended to be. Now that I am here, where am I? As we read his poems and stories, we think about the culture of eating practices, what people will eat and what they will not. We think about the bizarre compromises people make in their intimate lives, why is the married couple such a source of comedy and disgrace? And we think about our work lives. Certain foods, relationships, and jobs are acceptable, and others are not. In Din's poem, Clean, 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 which is in this month's issue of Harper's Magazine, and in his new poetry collection, Some Kind of Cheese Orgy, a voice says, I have the most respect for new immigrants. You work so hard. Circulating online these days is a blog post by a restaurant owner which offers a list of 100 commandments for his wait staff. And here are four of them. And I hope the wait staff at this restaurant are new immigrants or feel as if they are because they need to be ready to work hard. So out of the 100, I've selected four. Here are the four of the things he says to his white staff. Never assume people want their white wine in an ice bucket. Inquire. Do not pop a champagne cork. 
Remove it quietly, gracefully. The less noise, the better. Never remove a plate full of food without asking what went wrong. Obviously, something went wrong. <laughs> Never touch a customer. No excuses. Do not do it. Do not brush them. <laughs> move them. <laughs> do not move them. Wipe them or dust them. Okay. And as a poet, Lindin wants to express, I think, not only the language of dislocation, but the experience of dislocation in language. One of the lines in his poem, and it's, it's a poem with all 26 letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, and so on. In that poem, one of the lines says, rehearse the oral language in the indigenous manner. In Din's poetry, this oral and indigenous language as we hear it is bound to dislocate native English speakers. It dislocates me. Not for him are certain words acceptable and others are not. In the 21st century, there is no native English speaker. You all know the expression, we tailgated before the game and man, I'm so full. Do you know this? I'm making it up, but <laughs> tailgating? Have you tailgated? I have not tailgated, but <laughs> I think people do it. So I'm making up an expression I think you know. In Din's poem, Late Sorrows, a voice says, and I preface it this way because I don't know how to read this poem, but I'm trying. We find this in his poem, Late Sorrows. If the tailgates are diced into triangles after cooked so that I can still see them, then I will not eat them. But if the tailgates are melding in with other foods after cooked so that I can't see them, then of course I will eat them, even though I know I'm eating tailgates. End quote. Do you know? Can you see them? Are you eating tailgates? What's wrong? Did you not like your meal? Would you like to see our dessert menu? <laughs> I'm having fun with his poems, and I hope you do too. Here's Lyndon. Thank, th thank you, Logan, for the introduction. I actually forgot... Um, having written those lines, but uh, <laughs> it's good. Um, I, just, I was just in Austin, Texas, and I uh, gave an apartment reading, and uh, I was telling Logan I f it felt so good to be in, doing this apartment reading. So I'm going to pretend that this is an apartment, and this is a, another apartment reading. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from my new book, Some Kind of Cheese Orgy. Um, Some, uh, some body poems, body parts, body parts poems. Poem before mirror. I have forgotten your name as you mine, but I do remember one of your presentations. Bottom smooth, free of tricks and errors, with a nose over a chewing mouth, etc. So sloppily made, will this face last a day or a week already? This color, musty and sagging, for mere seconds ago, totally. Evil shed from a divine face versus euphonic, and soothing syllables from a deviation. Trust me, lie back, after fingering your patient mug with my seasoned digits. I would say that your face is neither representative, presentable, nor a gift to humanity, frankly, yet even sanded, erased, or kicked with a slanderous and soggy definition, you will still be you. I'm sorry, but I really don't know you. You had a different facet of facade the last time we rubbed faces. 
A breathtakingly radiant face still can't compete with more salient and silent parts of its in soul package. Okay, now we move from the face to the hands. Next two poems are hand poems. Thoughts while walking home. Your hands are indispensable without the opposable thumb or complex operations such as the hand job or pending the constitution would have to be automated or contracted out to these low-balling aliens legs on the other hand are so flighty they tend to run back and forth off their own free will they so uppity anything that can be done on the go can be done in c2 therefore i propose that all legs be amputated a minute or two after birth so that a man can be intimate with all that are closest to him how to foster man chops own thumb off replaces it with his toe works just as well sort of is happier than he was before lops his own dumb the man off replaces fucker with his brows works even better than before his wife in sympathy slices her own after images of a lot of these poems are kind of an extension from this the um, two books previous it's called borderless bodies a lot of my poems up deals with the the body as allegories and and uh, emblems etc and parts of the body this one is called Two more body poems from this um, cheese orgy book. Looky here originally, gleefully lowering themselves lower, forms of life caress with their tongue, but those capable of wearing thick, cheap plastic glasses will even kiss with their hands. Hands keep all marvels and dangers at arm's length. They are the first acrobats and media stars. I enjoy watching them do what I can only dream of performing at home. Okay, last one, uh, last body poem for this book is called Trunk. A man size secret inside a woman, mensch or balcony. Cactus snug inside is another me truer naturally, but basically much redder and wetter. Like any bombshell, I prefer to withhold our divergent kicks until the moment of varum. Speaking of tendons, I will soon invent a new lingo based on an alternative Bosch. Yeah, Logan was asking before about my um, use of uh, low, low, low words. I think I do mix it up. It's not just, uh, you know, um, um, because I have that kind of um, background, you know. I mean, um, I mean, there's no word that shouldn't be used, right? So, so this is a poem about words. It's called Eating Morphemes. Eating morphemes. Same word, different syntax, different word. No longer held or possessed. This word has wandered off and cannot be slaughtered in any long masticated, macerated mess of a sentence. In short, it is a forgotten chord, a missing feeling or flush ideogram. God damn this word shape shifting on me, surgically tamper, deftly airbrush and voguing with a feather boa. 
if not translated. Word lit by tungsten lamp versus chubby aromatic candle versus bathed in pitch darkness so that it must be felt with startled hands. Listen, massaging a word, you become informal, intimate, and unabashed with its muscles and even, if everything goes right, its bones and tendons. As for word topiary, you can now choose bushy bohemian, wax Brazilian, traditional and neat triangle, mohawk or ball. Naked, a word needs not be full frontal. It can be show a slant or even tush side, turning from the waist. Uh, this book is a little unusual because um, I'm, I'm starting to rethink my, in my um, engagement with the internet. Um, the last book was written, a lot of them were uh, written as blog posts. And this, um, this book, a lot of the poems I was sending out to this journal in Australia, actually a lot of them were written Vietnamese first. I write most of my poems in English, but in, in this particular book, at least half of these, these poems were written Vietnamese. And I would send them to Australia in the morning. As I get up, as I write them, and then later in the morning they'll be up already. So they were written very quickly, um, w which is kind of thrilling for me because you know, it, 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 before you you know you send a poem out six months later you get a rejection letter. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> it just was stupid. So I was like, you know, in the beginning it's like you can't get anything published, and then you know after a while you know you can get, you can get anything published. So, but. Um, um, but this, these poems are written very quickly, which I think was kind of uh, exciting for me. But I'm, I'm starting to rethink my engagement with the internet because it allows me to instant, instantly publish. Right? So uh, we'll read a few poems from this called Borderless Body, Bodies. Obsolete Maps. There are spots on your body that are never touched or seen, nearly impossible to reach even. Connoisseurs of the human body don't know what to call them. Borders, where bones always nudge against the fuzziest skin, where inside and outside are confused and flushed. Process food. On my hands and knees, I reach behind the Bauhaus of her stained porcelain bowl for a rainbow of M&Ms. Trinity. Out of her laboring hole, her husband's head Though full grown, it was blind and beardless. She slapped it when it demanded songs and teats, asymmetrical. They lay next to each other, a mingling of breath, dirt, and saliva. Sick of the one, she gave birth to another. Eating and feeding. Always starving, he suckle his wife. Famished, she suck her husband. For appetizers, he nibble her fingers and toes while she gnaw on his shanks and thighs. Becoming intimate with each other's meat, they marinated each other's meat to stew, deep fry or roast, or they ate each other raw. Even with exposed bones, tendons, and flesh, they still had each other, two intact heads, to smile at each other each sunrise.
language and meat. Language comes from meat. Without meat, there's no language. It's too obvious. Meaty words shape and roll by a meaty tongue, such as tender, juicy, or slice, for example, would be meaningless without the muscles, tendons, and fat that wrap around bones. Words such as dead, lovely, haggard, touch, desire, or satisfaction. Further, everyday language is overstuffed with meat. Don't you slander my meat, a piece of meat. She turned down such prime meat. Okay, another sort of a language. Um, yeah, I think one recurrent theme in my, um, in a lot of my, many of my books are, um, um, the arbitrariness of language, you know, and the, the oddness of language. So this one is called The Difficulties of Poetry. The Difficulties of Poetry. This poem was written underwater in a steel bubble surrounded by blind and asexual fish. This poem was composed jointly by a deaf man and a mute woman, two strangers tied together naked in a dusty abandoned house. This poem was not written but flung onto the tent wall of a field hospital by a soldier about to die. This poem was incised in concrete in sub-freezing temperature in complete darkness. This poem was sketched with tinted dirt. No, it was transmitted with bird sounds by a decomposing corpse. This poem has not been written under the best of conditions. The lamp had a green bias. The day was overcast. Um, in, in Blood and Soap, which uh, many students read in uh, Logan Scott, there was one of these one-sentence stories. Um, and in this book, book uh, Borderless Bodies, there's a series of one-sentence poems. So I'm going to read these. Uh, in a sense, it's a continuation of the one-sentence stories, except for these have line breaks. One-sentence poems. I hesitate before the penetrating seasoned, bright, slightly wicked face above a smooth white body, perhaps malnourished. She yearned to be impregnated by each bold, extravagant mind she met on the yellowing page. Each night without fail it ran at exactly 2.13, but she never picked up the phone because that's the exact time he died. All morning, a live ant carries a dead ant across the vast, cheap polyester carpet in grief or hunger. Before making love drunk, after the party, mother and son-in-law despise each other. Insolent, stupid, or insane, he declared his occupation as resting, yawning, and sleeping. He wears outdated clothes, eats outdated food, lives in an outdated country. Based on defeats, big, small, and spectacular, a lifetime of continuous defeats he decides to pen, an instructive book for humanity to stimulate progress and righteous living before he dies. Deaf, blind, missing arms and legs, cake in blood, he crawls onto the stage, 
to receive his medal from a draft dodger. Tearing up, puffing, he twisted my arm, yanked my hair before he hand me the diamond studded wedding ring. Morning, night, in light or darkness, I took the initiative, then waited, waited and waited, but he wouldn't dare touch me. Though she's of a different race and half his age, he likes to bury his face in her tangy armpit and calls her mom. Though he's of a different race and decidedly sunken chested, she likes to suck his nipples and calls him mom. Infatuated with women's traces more than actual women, he's absorbed in collecting every fragment, memento, trinket, fossil, souvenir, scent, vapor, and drip of women. After sex, she always forgot the name of whoever was next to her. The last day on earth, the sun doesn't set but rises, rises, and rises. Out of all sounds and colors, he can only hear two notes and see two colors. Reading this sentence, he forgets the previous because his mind can only contain one relatively short sentence. Reading this word, he forgets the previous because his mind can only contain one common and not too abstract word. A lifelong liar, he doubts everything, including dogs barking and birds chirping. To collect a paycheck each week, he must lie nonstop to everyone, including his wife, kids, dogs, birds, fish, snakes, and horses. He would only eat each dish once, talk to each person once, sleep on each bed once. Lying alone, naked, wrinkled, and ripe, he still mumbles in satisfaction, betrayal is power. He's hypersensitive to every shift twitch, twinge, belch, and hiccup of his soul, and oblivious to the conditions of every other living thing. He's very philosophical about the great suffering of others, and very emotional about his minor irritations. He always sees another's misfortune, as a consolation, a spiritual boost, frankly, a personal struck of good luck. He knows a little about everything, except the things he knows nothing about. Okay, I'm going to um, read a couple of longer pieces from Blood and Soap. Um, Um, half of this book was written, roughly half of it was written in Italy, and half of it was written in Vietnam. Well, there's some um, American stories in it. So I went about, f uh, for a period of five years, I spent, about six years, I spent five out of the country. So, um, so by the time I wrote this book, I was very removed from the American context. And so, the, you know, these stories are most, they feel kind of foreign and alien. 
So, okay, the first one I'm going to read from this is called um, uh, Parmigiano Cheese. One does not, cannot go to Parma without bringing back some Parmigiano cheese, of course. And thus it was only natural that Massimo Epiphany, a native of Otranto, came back from a week-long trip to Parma with an exceptional wheel of Parmigiano, aged for three years and weighing no less than 90 pounds. He barged into his house, craving his beloved cheese like a huge baby, and in his excitement even forgot to kiss his lovely wife, Claretta, who had been waiting anxiously in the living room for at least half an hour to greet him. Although it was not dinner time, he insisted on sampling the cheese right away. This was when everything quickly went wrong. According to one version, it was the wife, Miff, at not having been kissed at the door, who started to hack at the cheese with a butcher knife, thus provoking her husband into a murderous rage. According to another version, it was the husband who did the cutting. It was his slow, tender handling of the cheese, accompanied by many unctuous comments such as, the cows are very different in Parma. And you must not hurt such a beautiful cheese that broke his lovely wife's heart and drove her into a jealous fit of retaliation. According to one neighbor, she was heard screaming at the top of her lung, Go ahead and kiss that cheese, why don't you? Someone then shouted, No, no, no. Maybe it was, Yes, yes, yes. In any case, by the time the carabinieri arrived half an hour later, there were only two pale corpses embracing on the floor. One male, one female, cut up every which way imaginable, lying in a vast pool of blood and cheese. Um, it's funny because I was in uh, Chicago. I thought, if, you know, I've been traveling so much, I've been talking so much, I'm, I'm, I can't think of the guy I was talking to in Chicago, but a friend, <laughs> you know. So. He's from Romania and was like, like um, Primo Levi, the, uh, the Italian writer who was put in the concentration camps during World War II. Primo Levi was, you know, put in all these camps, and then when, the, when he, he was rescued, it was the Russian who rescued him. So he ended up in Russia, of all places. And so on the way back, he passed through Romania, finally. And uh, Romania is close enough to Italian, just the rhythm of it, that he felt such, such a kind of a bliss, you know, I was telling, you know. It's just so it's funny, it's like even when the words don't match the rhythm, you know, the, the rhythm is kind of a syntax. So that that kind of so uh, uh, when I some of these my my Italian stories shows the kind of Italian rhythm <laughs> you know what I'm saying so it's weird how you how these things soak in okay so here's another Italian story a worshipper of beauty yeah the two talks I've get, I've given today already uh, is I've been stressing a sense of um, being together and. Uh, you know, just uh, make, making allowance for each other. And when I was in Italy, I noticed that because, you know, obviously they had the piazza. And um, I found that, you know, they, they would create events out of nothing just to entertain each other, you know. Um, so this story is a little bit about that. It's called A Worshipper of Beauty. Among the many beauty pageants that grace the end of summer, None is more compelling to this worshipper of beauty than the sleeping beauty pageant in Forte di Mami. Let the vulgar flock to the Miss Underage Fanto Nudity Contest in nearby Via Reggio. The last day of August will always find me front and center with my mouth wide open and my eyes unblinking with my chin resting on stage at the sleeping beauty. This year's event was particularly satisfying. 72 contestants were flown in for the three-hour extravaganza. I could not wait for the lights to dim and for the gurneys to be wheeled out. There was no music, of course. The MC spoke in a whisper. The audience had to be warned repeatedly by the stern ushers never to applaud. And out finally came Miss Amalfi. She was lying prone under a pink cotton sheet, her black hair radiating from her white face, her breathing irregular. 
with her mouth trembling slightly, she appeared to be trapped in a nightmare, a sight that moved many of the judges as well as the whole audience. Next came Miss Barry, lying supine with her face turned away. All we could see was hair, no neck even. The back of a woman's head is not this man's idea of a turn on. A tactical mistake, surely. Who is Miss Barry's manager? Then came Miss Baletta, a classic sleeping beauty. Serene, oblivious, your sister or mine, from that mythical summer night a long time ago. Miss Cosenza left some of us gasping. With her bloodless lips and bluish complexion, Miss Cosenza was perhaps in a coma. Miss Gubbio, at 15, the youngest of the night sleeping beauties, was seen lying on her right side clutching a stuffed bear, a contrived prop that fooled no one. Miss Grossetto, at 37, the oldest, was also clutching a stuffed animal, a python, an attempt at humor more pathetic than touching. Miss Padova was passed out after too many drinks and sprawled across her messy gurney. Miss Pisa, naked, was tossing and turning. Miss Trieste was visibly pregnant and dozing fitfully under a mound of colorful blankets. In spite of the heat, she was wearing a thick pair of socks. The progression of so many sleeping beauties, all beautiful, all sleeping, left me woozy by the end of a long night. The sight of a beautiful woman sleeping, I will always cherish above all else in the world. Three times I had to reach out and touch the wheel of a rolling gurney. Is she sleeping yet? Of course she is sleeping. If only I could have fallen asleep myself, right where I was. I didn't care who won, and in fact, I never knew who won. Okay, another sort of a exhibition story. I'll read this and I'll tell you the context behind it, okay? It's called A Moving Exhibition of Reptiles. I am an exhibitor of reptiles. It's in my blood. My father was in the same line of business, and so was my grandfather. From early childhood, all I ever thought about was reptiles. I ate and slept reptiles. Even in late adulthood, all of my dreams contain at least one reptile. That's why I'm in this business. Twelve months out of the year, I crisscross this thin, long country of ours to show off my reptile collection. At each town, I pitch my lovely tent on a dusty plot of land, then plaster all the surrounding walls with my posters. Even if you have never seen my fabulous show, you have no doubt noticed my beautiful posters. Suitable for framing, they are printed on real cardboard in four colors and will not fade. There are those who have accused me of false advertising. They like to vetch that my snakes always appear much longer on paper than in person. That my salamanders are not nearly as colorful or exotic up close. And that my illustrated alligators, computer enhanced perhaps, seems primeval, ferocious, while the actual alligators in the show are obviously drug, passive, and practically made out of rubber. If you flip one over, you can clearly see in the tiniest print the always pathetic words made in China. There are others who cop that my exhibition includes no two-headed snakes or dragons or viper that devours his own tail. I cannot waste my time on these people. My critics are obviously only frustrated ex exhibitors of reptiles. Though they complain, they are always among the first to purchase tickets when my show arrives in town. From inside my booth, I can clearly see them coming from afar, now running, now walking, their faces glowing with a childish excitement. Often, they knock real children out of the way to be the very first in line. And yet, I do not gloat. Calmly, I can dispense tickets to my enemies without even a smirk on my face. 
it's no mystery why the whole world is so eager to see my reptiles. Where else, let me ask you, can you and your children learn everything there is to know about this poisonous universe? Where even the most insensate and shell-shocked among you can experience such a rare lost emotion as revulsion mixed with longing and pity. How much time do we have? Are we, are we okay? Yeah, should, should, should we switch ourselves? Uh, if you want to do some questions, yeah. Okay. The next I think I'll, yeah, that's good. Yeah, let's, let's have a question and answer. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Now I'm eager. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's just uh, um, my wife and I went to the circus in 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 the Ch uh, and um, we asked an Italian friend whether we should go. And he said, "No, don't don't bother." You know. So um, it was just the the you know it's like the the. The tightrope walker was like this high off the ground, you know. What I'm <laughs> I mean, everything was just nonsensical, but it was it was a great show, you know. What I'm saying it's like, so it just it was so sweet to see them performing these pointless acts for each other, <laughs> you know. Okay, I'll give you an example. We, we we joined a walking club through the supermarket, right? So we would we would just walk. And we'll be like to the next town. It's like you go, you like you go into Long Beach and walk or something. It's just why, you know. But we would go. <laughs> and then one time, the next event was like just go outside of town and look at some weird star alignment or something, you know. So I saw the guy, the the leader of this walking club in town. He said, "Well, are you, you know," he asked me, "Am I going to join the club to, for the next outing?" And I say, well, you know, it's only outside of town, you know. I, I, don't, I think I'll skip it. And he looked at me like, like I'm really, like, dumb or something. Like, you know, he said, that's not why we get together, you know. So that's just something about them, you know what I'm saying? Right? I mean, here we would just drive to Long Beach by ourselves. We're not going to organize a trip, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I don't know. There's something very nice about that. So, okay. Yes, somebody else. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to answer you like spontaneously. So if you ask me this tomorrow, I might give you a completely different answer. Okay. But just as you say that, I thought of Malcolm X when I was in high school. I read Malcolm X for the first time, right? I remember him talking about, um, uh, you ever heard of the word conk? Conk? Probably no one knows yeah, conk. Kinky, kinky hair, right? To straighten his conking your hair, right? So he talked about the body image of black folks, how they would conk their hair to straighten it, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so I think that haunted me, that image haunted me, you know what I'm saying? The idea that if you are not in the visual majority, you know, if you're not in the visual majority, then you become hyper-conscious of every little thing about your body, okay? And I remember when I, when I, I had a very brief career as an art critic. I wrote some art reviews, you know. And I remember talking to a painter in New York, and she said uh, the Pepo Bismo commercial, like the guy was re really Jewish looking, you know. And I said, I never thought of that, you know what I'm saying? But she, she, she said, you know, like Jewish people are supposed to have bad, I don't know, stomach problems. I, don't, I, don't, I never heard of, heard of that. But she thought the guy in the Pepo Bismo commercial was really Jewish looking, and somehow that was some kind of weird jab, you know. So it's, if you're not in the visual majority, you, you start to think these thoughts, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, the, uh, okay, one more example. David Mura, turning Japanese, also talk about that, you know. Because um, he is a uh, Japanese American who grew up in Minnesota, you know. So it's like uh, the last thing. Okay, I want to I want to emphasize the last thing we should apologize about is who we are, you know. 
I mean, I did not make myself, okay? <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, okay, I can apologize about many other things, but not about my f physical being, okay? And yet, that's how, that's how, you know, we, we are, we are, you know, we are forced into this, this kind of defensiveness. So, so you know what I'm saying? So, I, I think that's very interesting. So, you know, the fact that, that, that we have to apologize for just being ourselves, it's just preposterous. And it's criminal, <laughs> it's criminal, you know what I mean? So, so that's, my, that's my interest in the body, okay? And also the body, without overlaying with all this racial stuff, it's also the body is a kind of allegory, you know what I'm saying? Because the body is a process, okay? So, yes. Um, I think there's always, there's, you know, in a sense, we're never at home in the body, you know what I'm saying? I mean, in spite of all this social, racial, whatever, we, we're not quite at home in the body, you know? The, com the, the amount of work we invest in the body to present ourselves is, I, I find, fascinating, you know what I'm saying? So, um, um, I mean, the fact that we have clothes on at all, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's funny enough, right? So, uh, does that make sense? So, so, so in a sense, we, we, that tension is, is constant, you know? I mean, we frame the face, you know what I'm saying? All of our efforts is in framing the face, right? Because we have the most control over it, right? We can, like, it's the most expressive part of ourselves, you know what I'm saying? So, so and the rest is just like, you know, we we package it in, in in so many different ways. Does that make sense? I know it's such a you know. I mean, at, I mean at this late stage, it's still to still be talking about the body, I find very funny, right? I mean, but, but it's an endless subject, don't you think? Right, so yeah. Does that answer your question, sort of? Yeah. Okay. And then in the, in the two earlier talks, I talked about the notion of glamour too. So glamour is all tied into that. You know, glamour tied into, into that. And um, it's about the notion of humiliation, you know. And also, my, I'm, I'm doing this uh, photo project in which I photograph people without their consent, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, the reason why I do that is because I, I, don't want, I don't want them to pose. I don't want them, you know, to, to present themselves. So, I sneak up on them. Sometimes I photograph from the chest, you know. Sometimes I hide behind a car and I pop out suddenly, you know. <laughs> So, so what's so, yeah, so what's so bad about that, I realize, is that people don't like to not have a chance to, to compose themselves. They really get pissed off. Okay. Um, I'll tell you something. Just, just being in Los Angeles two days, you know, I've been in MacArthur Park and I'm, you know, downtown and whatever, you know what I'm saying. I was in Santa Monica today. You know, I just go and look at, and I noticed and in Philadelphia, I've been photographing all over. Uh, if I approach a man, a homeless man, and I give him like two bucks or something, he say, "Yeah, sure." A woman usually, no. You know, she she she, she get you know her vanity. You know, her, her one woman say, "You want to photograph me because I'm so dirty?" You know, so I felt kind of guilty. You know, so but a man is like okay, it's like a, it's almost like. If I were that wretched, it's almost a kind of pride, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I'm still here. But a woman, is, it really hurts her to be seen that way. So anyway. So, but, the, you know, the investment we put into self-presentation, you know, I find interesting. You know, so anyway, okay. Um, I think my prose and my poetry, they, is, some of it, it can be put in either category. You know, some of my po poems are sort of 
or some of my prose can uh, almost po poetry. I think the main advantage, the main uh, tool that you have as a poet that you don't have as a pro as a prose writer. I mean, maybe maybe the only one that is the de demarcation is the line break. You know. So what does that mean to have a line break? It's like you jam. You can jam with a poem. You know. You can jam with a, with prose. But otherwise, I don't see any difference. As, you know. I don't want to see. It. But what is enjambment, you know? I mean, just surprise people by, you know. And you also control the pace of the, of the reading, the pace of the, of the movement of the poem, that's all. So, so yeah, that's it. Enjambment is the only difference, for me at least, in my practice, okay? So, yes. Oh, actually, only this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is like two books ago, yeah. No, I just like getting up in the morning and have a poem published by, by lunch. <laughs> it was just fun to do that. I, I, I got so excited with that that the readers of that particular journal got really sick of me because I, I'm just relentless, you know. Every morning there's more of my stuff, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, one more, one last one. It was just a bad joke. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I really want, you know. Um, but this notion of mobility, I think, is overrated. Okay, I, I really think. I mean, talk. I, I really, I'm really somehow very um, reactionary in that sense. You know what I'm saying? Instead of wanting more speed, I just, I'm, I'm really against speed. I'm really against movement. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and and I travel all over, you know. You, you give me a ticket, I'm out of here. So you know, so yeah, I know, I know. It's a contradiction there. I think people are reading very sloppily now, you know, the blogging and emailing is, is, um, is, is very hard to have the patience to read a long text now because I think emailing and blogging and tweeting or whatever, you know what I'm saying? I think, I think it has really affected how we perceive things and, and yet I'm seduced by it and I'm using it, okay? I cancel my Facebook account, you know, because I just couldn't. I didn't want to have two thousand friends, and you know, I just didn't want it. So, I know I'm, I'm, it's very contradictory because a part of me likes what it can offer, you know, but a part of me think it's very harmful. I really, I really mean that. So, yeah, but you know, do 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 I do I or do any of us have the dis have the discipline to to shut some of it down? I'm, you know, it's something you have to decide for yourself. I didn't have a television for the longest time, and I think I got a lot, lot done. And yet, when, 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 when I did have a television, I was astounded by what was on there, because I didn't know. I was so out of touch, you know. So everything was, like, really exciting, you know, for a little while, okay? So, okay, anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Okay.